kids are beating you out. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got kids who are... They probably wake up earlier than some They really do. <laughs> <laughs> it is Saturday. Um, we've got uh, kids from Hempstead Hill Elementary who are largely, I think, 7th and 8th graders. Is that right? So here is my question for you, and I want you, when you answer the question, to turn around to the audience and tell them, because that's who you're talking to. I want you to think about and articulate what it is that the adults in your life, principals, administrators, teachers, assistant teachers, family members, what are the things that we can do to allow you to be more successful in getting your education? Well, um, my teacher, sometimes it's hard to um, sometimes uh, listen to him because sometimes it is a little boring. And I know that children like to be engaged and sometimes. And sometimes we like, um, we like to learn more on the details instead of having just the basic facts. And we also would like a more fun um, like format for things to be done. And we like also we also love hands-on activities, and, um, and it also helps us learn too. Mm. My name is Naya. What I'm Dojo. Huh? What year? Oh, seventh grade. And, and by the way, she's from New York, and she prefers New York to Baltimore, <laughs> and it is our job to change that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so state your name, your age, and and what year you are in school. Hi, I'm Deboria Ross, and I'm 12 years old, and I'm in the eighth grade this year, and next year I'll be going to Western High School. Right. <laughs> um, I think that to make um, students in my class and students all over my school more successful, we um, should have more choices. Um, I really went out as far as looking for a high school. Uh, my, three, my first three choices were probably Western and City, and each of them had a flaw, but um, I had to cancel some of them out to end up with Western. But um, if there were more choices, if there were more choices, even in our school, we already have a lot of choices, but more can always be better. Um, it would have been a lot easier to find out what high school I wanted to go to. And even when you just just thinking about what you want to be when you grow up, having more choices makes that a whole lot easier. So thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Rojas. I am in seventh, in seventh grade. And I think that the teachers do a really good job preparing us for tests like the MSA and just other you know numerous tests that we take at school. Um, and I think teachers should do maybe a little better jo job of, I guess, preparing us for things that will happen later on in life like high school things like stuff that we could that they could help us understand more maybe um and just things like that would really help us better in life so yeah. hi uh, my name is c and i'm in seventh grade um first of all i want to say um I'm from Atlanta, and um, since I moved to um, Baltimore this year, I really like um, Hempstead Hill Academy, and I think it's a great school. And um, something I think um, that could help um, us achieve even better is like, um, like Deboria said, more choices. I mean, um, we understand that um, the teachers have to teach like certain stuff, but um, I think like bet more choices will really help because. So, like um, different people have different perspective of what's like, what they like and what they don't. So, I think if we um, get to and like um, if teachers like um give us like more choices of as what to learn. I mean, um, I totally understand that it's, um it's nobody's um uh, fault or anything because um we have to learn certain stuff to help us get through life, but um. More choices will make it more funner, better. Um, my name is Kathy, and I'm in seventh grade. Um, I think that um, um, something that would make the school better would be like um, 
of, to follow up on Alex's, so the teachers should teach more th more things. Like th what mostly what the teachers teach is what what's in the book and what we should know for the test. But I have some friends that went to graduated to high school, and they tell me all the time the school it's like for tests and stuff. Right before we they we had the test, the teachers tell us this, this, and this, and then on the, the on the test, we just write it down, but, but in high school, they get used to that, and then they, they don't, un they don't get it, so I think that the teachers should trust the students more, and give them more res responsibilities and stuff, and then that'll help them grow up more. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larise Simmons. Um, I go to Hempstead Hill Academy and um, I'm in seventh grade. Uh, I think that what would make our school, uh, what would make our classmates better understand, um, like to achieve and, and full success, is that I think that we should have some more hand on activities. And I like about my teacher is that once he teaches a skill, if a student doesn't, does not know, like exactly what the skill the skill is, he will uh, come to you and actually uh, actually come to you and say and teach you how in different ways how you could know the uh, skill, and um, and I think that some some classmates inside our class uh, they need to understand because once they get out in the real world, like in high school and college, that they going to start having to own up and have take responsibility of their actions and stop playing because Hampstead Hill, Hampstead Hill's a nice school and they they keep stuff away from you so just to prepare you for life and because um, they make sure that that you know what you're supposed to know and then soon as you get right there then they tell you what you need to do and it's not about just getting nervous or you know breaking down or something because my brother went to Polly from Hampstead and I'm trying to go to Polly as well make you know keep <laughs> <laughs> trying to go to Polly. I think well, that's gonna so. happen. <laughs> <laughs> so my, so I just want to just encourage all the young people that goes to our school just to make sure that uh, we prepare ourselves because some people go to uh, Polly, Western, Ball, um, Dunbar, and all that. So I'm just want to just make sure, you know, just make a long <laughs> short story. Uh, that, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> April, can I comment real quick? So. You can see what wonderful uh, kids we've got. And it's precipitous that uh, April should ask, um, what's wrong with Hampstead Hill? Because um, I can take notes. And um, uh, we, we actually, I was going to let everyone know that um, Ms. Freeman, who sits on a um, committee right now that we have going called the Student Outcomes Committee, is about to survey students and staff and parents as we think about what an eighth grader should know and be able to do as they leave us. Uh, Dr. Santelisis is fond of saying that her um, county and private school counterparts are not focused on the state assessment, but instead on being college and career ready. And that uh, thinking was what went into putting together this student outcomes committee where we're thinking about whether it's portfolios or writing or note taking or the kinds of skills kids will need in, um, in, the, in the top high schools and colleges. And so uh, this feedback is terrific. Thanks. I want to add one thing real quick, April, because I know we're on a time schedule. When we were in the room preparing and talking with the panelists before we came down, a testament to this incredible school and this incredible principal, um, when we were asking the young people to tell us about their school, what they like about Hampstead and the other schools, that brilliant young man who I think will go to Polly or any other school he really wants to go to, he said, you know, when I, when I go to Hampstead, he said, I feel safe. And how many of us, when we went to school, I grew up in the sticks, so I mean, I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley, but we think consciously, I like my school because when I'm in, within those four walls, I am safe. Mm -hmm. That's a testament to the environment that you're creating there. Um, and so we appreciate that. But can I say something about that? Is that I think the safety is the baseline. Yeah. What, what all these kids have expressed to me were, uh, they're critical thinkers. They're, they're, they're not afraid to express their opinion, which, which goes a long Absolutely. way in life, to solve, prob solve problems, to, to, to advocate for yourself. 
once you get to college, you really need self-advocacy. You really need to say, Professor, I'm not learning enough. Or, Professor, why did I get a C when I think I'm entitled to an A? And I think each one of those kids are capable of doing that. So mm -hmm. how do we get there? How does, how does every school in the city? I'm going to tell you how you get there. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how you get there. we got some parents and some teachers who are going to tell you how they got them there. So I'm going to ask the parents to stand up right now. If one, two. Oh, she went to the back with that beautiful baby. So I'm going to ask you to turn around <coughs> parent to parent, mm. parent to adult. You guys are clearly the parents of successful students, and um, you're doing something to make that the case. When you are interacting with other parents who are not necessarily stepping up to the plate, what um, benevolent advice would you offer to your peers? Uh, my name is Daryl Walker. I think the number one thing we need to do, <coughs> excuse me, with our kids is let them have a voice. I think a lot of times we tell our kids what, what they should do, what they need to do, and we never get feedback from them. And I think that's important because when you get feedback from your kids, not only are they learning, but you're learning too. Mm. So I think that if you let your kids have a voice and have a say and listen to them, I think it'll help them out and help you out also. My name is Phil Rojas. Um, I'm the father of Alexandra. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what advice would I have? Well, first, I, I think I, I could always do better myself. Um, pretty busy professional, um, just like most of you. Um, I think structure, um, standardization um, around the communication that you have with your kids <coughs> is important. Um, and I was really intrigued, actually, by what um, Dr. Amprey mentioned that you have this nonprofit organization uh, with focus around quality and productivity within the engineering world um, and other manufacturing environments in, in the United States. I actually have a Lean Six Sigma background. I'm a master black belt. For, that's just a glorified name for somebody who likes to make things better. Um, <laughs> but what I, so, so I'm real curious, and a question to, to you guys is, what kinds of uh, focus uh, study efforts or studies have we, have we made, have we done in terms of benchmark, benchmarking I hate to say best practices, but leading practices of the schools that are succeeding in Baltimore. Um, and then what are we doing to capture those best practices or leading practices and then deploy them in schools that are struggling? Um, I also think that performance management, um, <coughs> back to Ho uh, Mr. Hornbeck's point, is, is, is critical. How do we manage the performance of our teachers? How do we Im implement the measurement systems and, and standardize those measurement systems that work to drive the right types of behaviors? and expectations that we, we want to put down and apply towards our teachers. Right? Okay, I'm, um, gonna, I'm gonna table that question so we can get through the parents sure. and the teacher and guys hold on to that and we'll get back to that in the Q&A. But just, so just to what I think is a structure around how you communicate and one of the things in terms of leading practice that I have found very helpful is um, the frequency at which you know how your kid is doing. Mm. So I think weekly updates that the school provides in terms of grades is critical for me to know, hey, not at the end of the month or at the end of the reporting period, the grading period, that, oh, my, my, my child is struggling. So hmm. I think the frequency of communication uh, is critical. So sorry about that. I just oh, no went problem. on a rant, took the opportunity to do that. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Porter, uh, and I'm the mother of Laurie Simmons, mm. uh, who oh, spoke, young man. Working. Okay. Um, my son, he grew up in Hampstead Hill from, I think, kindergarten on up. So that's why he's so... You know, he's like he is, even though he's my son, and we put God first. But um, I really uh, am excited uh, about Hampstead Hill because my, um, I have two other sons who also graduated from Hampstead Hill as well. Um, but because he was there the longest. And I just think that so far as the other K through 8 schools really um, should look at Hampstead Hill because my prior to that, my children went to Walter P. Carter. Now, that, that was like in the early um, 2000 or early, but from that from that transition from that school at that time until uh, Hampstead Hill, I saw a big difference. To me, it was almost like from the pit to the palace, in a way, because it was so different, you know, because of I guess how things has changed from you know during that period of time from Walter P. Carter up into Hampstead Hill. So it was a difference because everything was new. It looked totally different. The teachers were hands on, and um, you know it was just a little more fellowship. It was just it was just better. You know what? I'm going to have to retool you. Mm -hmm. I want you to answer because you clearly know what you're doing with your child. 
<laughs> what would you tell other parents? How would you engage them in a conversation about how to create successful students? Because you clearly are doing that. Okay, so far as when they go to school, I mean, I mean, when they go to school, I try to go to school as much as I possibly can because I have a total of four children. Um, and when they come home, I ask them what they're doing. And I help them with their homework. And what they don't know, we try to find out. We go to the library. I have a communication with, you know, with the school as well because I have a son in Polly and I have a son, another son in Mervo. And when the key thing, too, when my son said about safety, I had a, my son to be jumped, you know, so far as gang stuff. So that, that's why I really stuck out in his head initially about the safety, because I'm going through that right now, court and all that. But just have that connection with the children, with your children at that conversation, communication. And we put God first. And that's what I tell them. I have them four principles. I say put God first. I say uh, respect yourself and others, you know, so far as doing your chores around the house. And, and just being all you can be and always have a backup plan. We have one more parent. Good morning, or oh, good afternoon. I think we're almost at now. I'm yeah. Naya Dozrell's mom, and of course, I'm a Hampstead Hill parent. And I have a quick, funny story about Hampstead Hill because we kind of ended up there. Um, when I, I moved from uh, Baltimore County, the Owens Mills area. And so I love the school she was at there, but of course it was at elementary. And I was petrified about putting her into Baltimore City Public Schools. I, I, I couldn't do it. So I'm trying to rework my household budget so we could afford <laughs> private school for middle school. And you're talking about $20,000 a year before you even get to college. It was just ridiculous. So I went down to, uh, I went over to Roland Park. Even though we weren't zoned for their school, we were zoned for Hampstead Hill with our new address. So I went to Roland Park Middle, and I'm pleading with the sixth grade um, principal to please let my child in. She's a wonderful student, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, what school is she zoned for? And I said, Hampstead Hill. And he said, oh, well, that, that's a great school. Like, you should at least give it a try. And I'm like, no, it's a, I, I, it can't be great. It's a Baltimore City public school. You guys are like the only middle school <laughs> that's good in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. So needless to say, he said, well, Start with the Board of Education and then come back and see if we have room because, of course, they never have room at Roland, at Roland Park. So then I went down to the Board of Education and once I got with, um, I forget the woman's name, but once I got with the representative to help me and I pleaded my case with her and she said, what school is she zoned for? And I said, Hampstead Hill. And she said, that's a great school. <laughs> and I said, but it can't be a good school because it's Baltimore City Public School. And so I started doing more research on Hampstead Hill. And then I went up there and um, I just kind of stayed in the office for a little while just to kind of see um, the students come back and forth and how the, the office staff handled the students and the teachers and just to see kind of what was going on because I couldn't go into the classrooms per se. And I was, I was impressed. And um, I was impressed when I, when I researched it and I was impressed from the, the look of the school from the office. And... I'm very impressed, and I, I do want to tell Mr. Hornbeck that I really appreciate what you're giving our students. You know, and that, uh, it, it means a lot to me because I feel like our students, especially um, African-American students, have so many things against them from the time that they're born. So I'm very proud to say that my daughter goes there, and I'm very proud to say that her teachers truly care about her education. But I would challenge the school to go even further because I, I, I'm on the back of Mr. Alex, I want to say that how do you know that each teacher that you are bringing to the school is definitely the type of teacher that's going to push each student? My child's a, a good student on her own. So I have a problem when they just let her just be a good student. I want her to be an excellent student. I, I did go to her teacher and say, yes, I know she has a 97, but how can we get her to a 100 for her grade? And she said, oh, she doesn't need to do anything different. I said, but it could be something because if she has a 97, that means that there's something lacking. There's something. Not that she's not doing anything good, but we want her to be excellent, and I want to find areas of improvement for her. I you can't tell me there are no areas of improvement. You 97. That's good stuff. <laughs> but you just can't tell me that's there are right. no areas that need improvement. Sure. So, so that's all I want to push. So thank you, Mr. Hornback. Thank you. <laughs> And okay. April, um, both Naya and Deboria were the leads in our spring musical production of Annie. Naya played Miss Hannigan and, and Deboria played Annie and they just wrapped up last week so they had uh, 
uh, quite an experience last weekend and uh, amazing kids, all of these guys. So. so we have, thank you, all of them. Thanks for your indulgence, but you can see this information that we're sharing is really powerful. Teachers, how many teachers do we have? One, two, two, okay. Hi, teacher in the back. Where are you from? Yes. Ah. Okay. <laughs> we do no political wow. stuff here, so erase that from the record. This is all about amplifying Baltimore. If you got your politics, they're outside. But I appreciate your, your contribution to education in Baltimore. You sound like you've been an incredible stand, and we really love that about you. Um, we had two teachers that were scheduled to right speak, here. one here and one here from Hampstead Hill. You're from Carver, right? Yes. Okay, we need some Carver up in here because, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Matt is smashing us over here. That's <laughs> right. Okay. So my question to you as a teacher, um, we know that your job can be tough, but we also know that you have a love for it or you probably would not be doing it. How can all of us make your job better, period? Um, I think that one of the things that really makes me passionate about the work that I do is um, the learning community that I have been lucky enough to find at in Baltimore City. Um, <coughs> I think that Baltimore City teachers have an untapped talent pool um, and the conversations that we have with each other about learning and about our students and about our students' growth and about assessments um, I think have been incredibly inspiring to me. Um, that being said, I really think that it's important that we have these conversations, not just with each other as teachers in a teacher's lounge or after school until five or six <laughs> in the afternoon. It's really important that we are also talking about learning and the mechanics of learning with parents and with administrators, and I really think that um, it's important that teachers are listened to and taken seriously, and I really think that we need to spend a lot of time really, really thinking about learning, because this whole, what I think the work that we do is incredibly complex, but it's also, it's, it's kind of like, it's what life really is. Life is about learning. Mm -hmm. um, so, I would love to have more of these conversations um, with more people, with more shareholders. I'd like to be, and I'd also like for our conversations to be really purposeful mm -hmm. and actually end up re resulting in action. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that uh, don't make sense in our classrooms and don't make sense in our systems, and we all know that, but, and, but we need to actually take this conversation about why do we use assessments that don't really do a good job of capturing student learning? Why do we, you know, why do we use an assessment that's designed to do one thing and actually use it to measure something else? That's <coughs> not, you know, but we actually need to really change that. It's, it's not, I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying because I'm a teacher, not a, I don't work at North Avenue, right. but it's, it shouldn't be that hard to, to really do what we all know is right for our kids and do what's right for learning. Right. So that's Thank what you. I would think. Our last teacher. Uh, hi, how are you? I am a second grade teacher at Hampstead Hill, very proud second grade teacher. Um, I think one thing which I am actually fortunate to have that I feel like most teachers or some teachers don't have in Baltimore City is a good support system. My team, my second grade team is fantastic. I am so blessed um, to have them and I know that many of my other Baltimore City teachers do not have the same luxury so that is one thing that I feel that most teachers can benefit from. We have daily conversations about what we can do for our children in reading, in math and all the subjects and not just subjects but what we can do for them outside of school. We just push them a little more. And another thing um, to go off of support is just I think that we need support from parents send your kids to school just little simple things with a good breakfast you know the proper supplies um, we need that a lot of my kids don't come with they tell me every day I didn't have breakfast I didn't eat breakfast today I need that energy I need that support from parents just so they can you know that I can do my job um, yeah 
<laughs> Thanks. And just so everyone knows, breakfast is free for all kids, regardless of income in Baltimore City. So 20 minutes before the school day starts at any Baltimore City school, anyone can have breakfast. So getting them there for breakfast, though, is a big deal. Ms. Swan was our director of community, is, is our director of community outreach. Is she in the room? She may be out. Ms. Swan, I, I just want to recognize my right-hand person in this work, and uh, she has been with Hampstead Hill for 24 years and is an essential part of uh, our community outreach, and I think she's going to be manning the table yeah, later. Yeah, she's going to be in the back. So, April, there's another teacher oh, here. Oh, oh, my goodness. Hi. I know you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My background isn't teaching, so it's, uh, it's a bit unique because I taught as a long-term sub for two and a half years over at, from, uh, in 2006, starting in 2006, over at Walter B. Carter, uh, when it was first in elementary school, and then it tiered to a middle school. I came there in the fifth grade. The reason why I came there, because it was an opportunity to mentor the, uh, the young men. My mother taught there for over 25 years. And she told me never to go into teaching and she said it for this, it wasn't the students, it wasn't the parenting, it was the school system. Here's the problem, systems don't, you can't build a relationship with a system, you build a relationship with people. So what her problem was, she saw a system which was once a modeled system for the United States, where teachers um, from New York, Philly, and so on, would come to Baltimore City, and they would study the Baltimore City school system because it was very successful. I graduated from Poly, okay? So I know that the school system in Baltimore is very successful. I've watched it produce uh, very successful young men and young ladies. But the point I'm making is this. What I've learned about teaching is this. Teaching is a calling, it's not a career. So when principals sit down and they audition teachers, you gotta ask yourself a couple questions. Is this a person fleeing a situation or is this person being called to one? That's number one. And the reason why it's this is so crucial because teaching is the only profession that makes every other profession possible. Mm. Without teaching, you don't have anything else. Doctors, lawyers, principals, politicians, whatever, the, whatever career path that a student takes is because someone taught them that and steer them in that direction. So it's very, very critical that you really work on what is now called your human capital or you, instead of being called human resource anymore. But your human resource is gonna be your greatest resource. And for the Baltimore City Public School System, in all honesty, the greatest resource would be the parenting. We know right now the parenting is wishy-washy from school to school. That's a variable, let's not focus on that. What we can focus in on are, is the teachers, What's the screening process? Again, my background isn't teaching, but I felt I was called to it. I taught for two and a half years, and I'm, I'm currently working in an after-school program over at the charter school, the all-boys charter school, um, Blueprint Drew Jameson, where they have two campuses, one on the west side and one on the east side, and I'm on the east side campus. But um, all I'm trying to say is that teachers, like she said before, need support. And it can be a tough situation for a teacher to not, uh, to feel as though the, their principal doesn't have their back, or the vice principal doesn't have their back, or North Avenue doesn't have their back. It's a tough position for teachers to feel like they have to be put in a performance situation to, in order to earn a paycheck. And that takes away from the learning. And our students need character. Wrap it up? Yes. Okay, good. It's okay, because I could go all day, all right? As only a poly man can. You got it. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. I had the opportunity to do one thing and implement a small mentoring program at Walter B. Carter for a short period of time. And what, the only thing I focused on was the building of the character of the young men. And what I noticed was this. It had to happen at the beginning of the day before any academics took place. Okay, we worked on character because as the day went on, their momentum grew. They became, if they were, off the chain in the morning, they were gonna be worse in the afternoon. So teachers need the, the character development support. Forget about the MSA and all that stuff. Here's my point. When the character's right, the grades will come. But we gotta get the characters right, and teachers need that support to build the character of the young men and the young ladies in the school system. Thank you. Wonderful. 
Okay. So this wasn't exactly how I planned it, but we're going to have to do a speed round of questioning. So please work with me because I know you want some lunch. Um, and we, we had sponsors pay for that lunch. <laughs> we're grateful for those sponsors. So what I'm going to do is to take about three questions at a time. We're going to start in the, be in the front, and then we're going to go to the back. So are there any questions here? There's one. Raise your hand so she okay. sees you. <laughs> uh, your name, what neighborhood you live in, and your question. Hold on. Excuse me one second. Can you turn off the house lights a little so we can see each other? Thank you. Go ahead. Andrew Carey. I live in Mount Washington. Um, just one comment with a follow-up question is there's never been a uh, problem with Baltimore City Schools uh, recruiting, but it's always the retention. Okay. So where are we with that? Okay, one more question. We're going to take three. Okay. Na neighborhood. Thank you. Sue Fothergill, I live in um, Beverly Hills. And uh, my question is um, specifically to Dr. Santelisis. I was very interested in hearing the, um, that part of the work is about building the team and I'd like to hear more about how that's actually happening when you have leadership in different areas of the system, overseeing specific you know, student support, communication, teaching and learning, and how that synergy is being created at North Avenue okay. or One Central more. HQ. Thank you. One more. David Troy. Yeah, this is um, just kind of a comment, and I would appreciate any, any response to it. Um, it occurs to me that um, our industrial age uh, conception of education that, you know, we sort of create students the same way we create, you know, parts on an assembly line is perhaps flawed. I believe that in the end we are the products of the people that are around us. Mm -hmm. And I think that the key thing that we're seeing in education is that we're really asking the school system to become the social fabric around which we surround our children in lieu of, um, perhaps a functioning social fabric that is provided by family and other kinds of supports. Because I think we all kind of know intuitively that a school is not a requirement to create a successful learner. What is a requirement is to be surrounded by people who value learning. Mm -hmm. So any comments on that I'd appreciate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quick reflections? You guys are really smart. I know you can do this quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll try to, you know, subvert my loquacious time. <laughs> So in terms of um, the teaming question, which was to me directly, I think one of the pieces that <coughs> we're working on, at least I know I'm working on, is more cross-functional work, right? So how we queue up cross-functional um, approaches to issues, problems, situations that come up at schools. I think the second piece that we're really doing is trying to, what I'm trying to do is walk my talk. So a great example of that is how are, um, at least centrally, how are we um, having cross-functional teams who are going out to schools together knowing that we're looking at the same thing, right? Because a lot of this teaming piece is how do we talk to one another? And then mm -hmm. I would say third, part of the shift, one of the reasons why um, at the Leadership Institute last summer, which was my first in the district, um, one of the reasons why we had some days with just principals but asked school teams was to experience the same thing together rather than waiting for one person <coughs> to bring back the information. Um, you get different everybody hears different things and you get stronger that way. So I'll just quickly say that, that the, the, the teaming piece is, is a real priority for me and I think a lot of that comes from being focused and deliberate about that and, tr and giving people support and training on what being an effective team looks like. So that was a quick answer. But Can yes. I take the retention uh, okay. and then comment? Jack. Um, just uh, there's two pieces on the retention. Um, one is uh, people come with uh, um, an interest in a profession, an altruistic or mission driven or however they come to it and then the retention is key. And um, uh, working conditions, I think, are um, a huge piece of that, creating the supports at the school level and um, the relationships and the working conditions, the resources. And there are uh, uh, lots of pockets of hope uh, around the city where um, uh, that's, that's happening. Um, and then the second thing that's, that's happening right now is this, uh, I'm sure you've read about it, the collective bargaining agreement that has uh, moved from a traditional steps and lanes model to a knowledge and skills approach and um, uh, creating career pathways where um, uh, evidence of performance and effectiveness produce uh, um, the ability to earn more and uh, you don't lose as many of your brightest stars to um, law or medicine or uh, investment firms. And so those, those would be a few of them. And then Sue's comment, um, uh, I just wanted to, we, we had a bus uh, two nights ago at um, two buses at the um, rally to save um, 
the funding for public schools in Baltimore City and Annapolis. And April, you asked what people could do. And uh, just to say in as apolitical a way as possible, um, call your elected representative. The vote is Thursday. And we really need to restore that $15 million because it's so directly connected to the work, to class size, to working conditions, and all of those things that it's essential that we, um, uh, when we were out there with uh, Dr. Alonzo uh, and, and the rain and, and uh, five or 600 people from Baltimore City, really important. How many? How many? Oh, was I off? <laughs> 1,600, which awesome. is 1,000 more than last year, which is extraordinary. Right. So um, right. thanks. Okay. Um, can I talk about the social fabric one just real quick? So there was a time when the school building actually held all the information or the school teacher held the information. People came to the building to receive that information. Now there's information everywhere. It's accessible to everyone. Kids have access to it. Everyone can have access to it, and that access is important. And it becomes important of how we use it and how we become critical thinkers and how we work collaboratively to change the world and make it a better place with all of these different perspectives, as you guys mentioned, the students themselves mentioned. And so um, I don't think the school is going to be in lieu of everything else that needs to make a great community. I think we define for ourselves what makes a great community. And right now we have the school system that we're imagining. And part mm. of this coming together is for us to imagine something even better mm. that doesn't leave anyone out, that has every neighborhood having it be where being a great student is part of the culture. <coughs> and so, um, and so maybe it is true that the schools are having to wrap around in a way they didn't before, but I don't see that as um, a negative or as a going backwards. I actually think that's, that's great and that we should embrace that and um, allow ourselves, because a lot of the teacher participation, the, this mindset of parents is just simply creating a structure to allow us to do our best work. Mm -hmm. And what we have that's really powerful in common is that every single parent, and I don't care how poor or rich they are or what their education is, cares and loves about their child mm. and wants them to do better than they hem themselves have done. This is what unites us, and it is universal, and it's about our humanity. And so using that in a powerful way and allowing for that to be what connects people who come from diverse backgrounds is what we can do now. We have that flexibility and, and partnership. Um, that's what we're here to do. Great answer. Shorter answers. We're running out of time. So shorter answers, please. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, am I? That's, oh, well, I, I just want to respond to two questions. With retention, I think, comes uh, intervention. And, I, and I'm, I'm really confused. This is a system problem that we, we know when a child is born in the city what school they're likely to go to. But somehow the system loses track of a child over time. And so there's a drop-off, actually, that no one seems to talk about honestly, Dr. Sanalisa. It's about <laughs> what happens with the eighth grade kids as they move into high school. They slip away. And we don't know them. We can't track them. If, if the AARP can find me at 45 years old, <laughs> why can't we find <laughs> these kids? And, and, and why can't we intervene deeply in their lives and to, 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 to solve to keep them in the school, because what's keeping them out of school is what we saw up here. They're bored, they're, they're bored to death. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they're actually bored. They're not engaged in learning, even though they want to be engaged in learning. And the second thing is what's happening outside of the school in their lives. And what do we, what's the urgency that we have to pull these kids back into the school and to give them everything they need to succeed right, in yeah, school? Exactly because point. without that. My second point is about the learning community. Quickly. Uh, quickly. Is that... Um, I have been in schools, hanging out in schools for three years, talking to lots of teachers and so on. And one question I, 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 I want to ask teachers, but I often don't, is just to find out how intellectually curious they are themselves. Mm. And to really and truly really ask them a question like, what book is by your bedside? What are you reading by your bedside? Because when you find a learning community where the teachers are learning, I assure you the students are learning. And if the That's teachers so are not good. learning, the students are not learning. That's That's real. Questions? Okay. Um, how many questions do we have? One, One two, two, three, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> okay. As long as we're okay as a community that this is going down, are we okay with this as community? We're still going to wrap. Like, like, let's try to do five. And be conscious time. of if someone's asking a question that you have in mind, then okay. you don't have to ask your question. <laughs> My name is Abigail Bryseth, and I live near the Hollands Market. And the Baltimore City school system is not owned by the Baltimore City, 
it is run by the state. And so even though the city contributes, I understand, about $200 million a year to the running of the school system, it does not direct what happens. So I'd like anybody to reflect on the ultimate question is whether the city is ready to take back control of our school system. But along the way, what is the interaction between the city and the schools? Because it, it does, cannot function completely and effectively as an institution and in isolation. Got it. Thank you. Next question. Where are you? Can you pop up and scream? Sure. Thank you. Great I want to job. do a quick note on that. Our, our next panel will probably address some of those issues with workforce and economic development. Thank you. Very quick questions. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Dan Morheim, Baltimore County. I do care about Baltimore City. Thank the statistic you. is that uh, Maryland is number one in education in the United States. What does that mean to you? Hmm. Uh, quick question. Another one? Okay. Uh, you are. Jan, who about the whole issue around the KIPP school right now in terms of uh, the teachers being allowed to vote for their own work rules, overriding union rules? be particularly interested in both uh, the heads of the schools here and the chief academic officer's uh, response to that. Hey there. Uh, I heard a startling statistic. Who are the, you? Uh, Plato Hieronymus, Tuscany Canterbury. Um, I heard a startling statistic, I think it was yesterday on the radio, that typically a private school funnels 80% of its budget into the classroom, whereas typically a public school, and I think these were national numbers, uh, is funneling only 50% of its budget into the classroom, the other 50% presumably in bureaucracy either at central headquarters or bureaucracy at the schools. So interested in, in the panel reaction to that. Okay. Two more questions in the back. Thank you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Michelle Acasa. I'm in Northeast Baltimore. I've homeschooled for over 12 years, and in regard to this idea of money following students, I'd like to know why there are not more resources available mm -hmm. for homeschools, and who up there is willing to work with me to help enrich the homeschool experience for the actual homeschoolers, mm -hmm. for the students. Mm -hmm. So I've addressed people about the portfolio process, um, all those things. I've had adequate results through working on them for a while but I'm interested in the experience of the homeschoolers. I've had not had so much as a notice about a software that I could get for a discount okay. from the Baltimore City Public School System. Thank you, Michelle. She has pages and pages of notes back here. Oh, she doesn't play. <laughs> My name is Christian O'Brien. I live in Druid Hill. Uh, this past summer, I was a graduate CEO intern at North Avenue. Um, I think that in urban education for decades, people have been present oriented, uh, trying to focus on inputs for students to try and improve their career and academic trajectories, um, but not focusing on those students' long-term responsibilities. What are some of the efforts that people are doing so that the kids will not be part of a diaspora that leaves Baltimore City and instead will come back to commit to community service in public service? Thank you. Great Ooh. questions. <laughs> okay. So it's always great to start with the diaspora. <laughs> um, but a couple of things I just want to say really quickly, and you can rein me in when necessary. 
this whole piece, and I'll probably cover a little bit. I'm not going to take like one question, but because I'm, we'll, we'll do it yeah. together, right? But this whole piece about who owns the system, what can we do? I actually have a different frame. I assume that the parents, that teachers at a school, that the principal at that school, right, own that school. Mm -hmm. That the community owns the school. And the differential ownership is evidenced when parents walk through the doors of the school. So I, I so this whole piece about wrestling with who owns the school and where does it I will say this that I have been in Baltimore City a year, right, within the schools, and I have not seen yet a school that really wants to move on behalf of kids and is not able to do it. And part of that is because I actually have the, having worked in a number of urban districts, not just Baltimore, believe that part of the issue with, with urban schools is that we sometimes replicate the disempowerment of the community mm -hmm. in which those schools reside in the way that we approach the schools. And so part of what we are about right now is not replicating disempowerment, wow. right? So I just wanna say to everybody here, if, if your child is in, a Baltimore City Public School, you do own that school. The question is, right, where you find the entry points, mm. right, and when you hit the obstacles, what you, right, how you let us know, because you're right, one person on North Avenue, right, is not gonna know every hole, but I will tell you, one of the great things about being in Baltimore City is that Dr. Alonzo, the team we have, the principals that you see up here, the teachers you've heard from, there are enough folks in this system who are committed mm. to hearing what, the, what those obstacles are and doing what we can to move them. Mm. So I just wanna make that ownership point, and it's the same, frankly, frame that I used in this question about what are we doing with, with, with these kids who we know need more. There are teachers every day who know kids need more and implement the more within the frame of their teaching, right? Sometimes that more, yes, is making sure that a kid gets, gets an eye exam, right? Which we know there are schools that do that. It is making sure that kids and families get linked to the resources that currently exist. And I'm, I'm, I'm you know, very hopeful that, that future panels and you'll get to hear some of that. But I am also gonna say that there, in part of how we teach, part of how we develop cultures at schools, right? We have kids now who do see their schools, right? As their refuge for what's going on in their lives. And that level of whether you, whether you view yourself as an agent of change, and do you have agency or don't you, is really fundamental to this question of whether we're gonna move urban schools or not. Because if we continue to answer our questions with waiting for someone mm -hmm. to give us permission, mm -hmm. then we will never move. So I'm just gonna, so, so that, that, that frames a whole lot of pieces. I'm sorry, before she you just leave, took us to church, before, I'm sorry. Before you leave that point too, my own view, and I think it's, uh, in the research, and it may have been implicit in the question, is that um, when a community spends time arguing over whether a school board should be appointed or elected, it is a waste of time. Yes. Yes. Don't change whatever you've got because it's not gonna mean more empowerment at the school level. There are elected boards that work and there are a whole bunch of them that don't. And we've got a board right now that is letting some really good work take place. And so each year in Annapolis, that is a perennial question that comes up, and it is a red herring. Don't go for that, because it's a, it's, it is a, a non-starter and a waste of time. Can, can somebody address the homeschool issue really quickly? Just a nugget, a nugget. I need that address. I, I love to address homeschool. I've taught a couple of homeschool kids, and I find them to be the brightest kids in the system. And I wonder why that's so, because I think that the, the parent who makes that decision, and there are lots of parents, particularly a lot of African-American parents who are, who are, who are taking back the, their, role, the, 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 their role in education and educating their child. And when I, I know one parent, I don't think he's here today, when he brought his homeschooled child to Roland Park at, the, at kindergarten, he could not, he wanted his child to be, I may not have this completely right, but he wanted his child to be in kindergarten or first grade, and they said, but he hasn't been tested. And he says, this child is off the, off the charts in terms of testing. So, uh, so the, when it comes to homeschooling, is as why are these parents doing so well with education, 
when some of our own schools that have everything in place are not doing as good a okay, job. Okay, but I think Michelle's yeah. question was about resources, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so in, ter in terms of, of yeah, in terms of resources, so let me just say that. I think one of the pieces that, um, that we need to do a better job of is making sure that homeschooling parents get those resources. So what I would just say really quickly, I would invite you to send me an email, right? Just send me an email and we will figure out how we not only get you in touch with the resources you need, but through your experiences, um, grant better access to homeschoolers throughout the city. Because I, some, and I don't mean this glibly, but some of my best friends <laughs> homeschool their kids, <laughs> right? So I don't have, I don't have any animosity. Believe me, if I weren't out worrying about everybody else's kids, there are days I wish I could homeschool. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that's the simple question. Send me an email. We'll get you connected in the way that you need to, and hopefully make it easier for other homeschool parents. Kirk, you want to say something? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I wanted to address the question around um, Maryland schools being number one. I heard a couple people chuckle when uh, that was mentioned or that question was raised, but you know, we really need to examine that closely because I think it's very important that we tell a better story about what's happening in Baltimore City. And you can say what you want about what the state is doing. They know how to celebrate their successes. Mm -hmm. And you know, certainly at my school, it's about telling our own story. And mm -hmm. much of the success I believe that Dr. Alonzo's had is reframing what Baltimore school or city schools is all about. And so you know, we, we need to learn from the state and what they're doing uh, with regard to advanced placement. I mean, how many of you know that you can have advanced placement courses at Carver or Bow Tech School? I mean, these are wonderful opportunities before our young people, and we need to challenge people when they say negative <coughs> things about, because with all due respect to their parent, she hadn't really experienced Baltimore City Public Schools before she had written them off. And so we need to really, really examine and challenge people when they make negative or, uh, comments about or disparaging remarks about our system. Although, can, I, I just want to think, I think when people are making negative comments, I mean, something about education is personal to everyone. We all have been educated one way or another. And we care very deeply about this. We wouldn't all be sitting here if we did not care very deeply. And sometimes I think when people say, you're making a negative comment, that we're criticizing people personally and individually. And I, st I, think, I think at least when I'm making a negative comment, if I do make a negative comment, it's about, well, what can we learn from our mistakes so we don't repeat them again? And so, yeah, when your very first question, April, was, what happened to that male from T. Rowe Price who doesn't want to put his kid, we produced an excellent person, and what happened to him? And so that's what I think we need to examine deeply, why our schools are not producing that T. Rowe Price fellow. Because but, we're, yeah. we're not able to tell the story. Hmm. Because I can tell you that, you know, and not outside of the big three, if you will, there's wonderful things happening in this city. Big three and high schools. The big three high yeah. schools, right? And I won't name them. <laughs> they know who they are. City. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, this is a charge. You're right. It is a charge. And what can be learned from it is that principals need to own that. They need to see them as a, themselves as executives, as CEOs of a wonderful uh, community resource that, you know, because at the end of the day, if you're going to change a city, you've got to change high school or schools in general. Okay, I'm going to stop here, unfortunately, because we've got food to eat. We've got other sessions. What I want to do in wrapping this up is to challenge everyone here. I'm single. I don't have any kids. Um, this panel was probably the most important panel that I produced because I live in a city where we are constantly telling ourselves a really nasty story about our education system. And it's one of the things that I think at the core foundation of, of the challenge of amplifying, that is at the core foundation of the challenge of amplifying Baltimore. Seriously. If our kids are constantly bombarded with images and representations that are always pathological and always tell the worst story about who they could possibly be through this education system, then they're going to walk right into that. And I'm so grateful that I had so many misty-eyed moments today um, listening to students, listening to parents, listening to our leadership, listening to the people of Baltimore talk about this because I saw the exact opposite of the nonsense that we take in every day about our city with regard to education. Do we have issues? Of course we have issues. Um, but do we have the will as the people of Baltimore to do something about that?
And I think you see from the interactions that we've had today from our brilliant young people, from our gifted and committed, committed teachers, from our parents who have incredible insights, and just to the general public, that we have all of the things that we need to make education in Baltimore City better. And I think it's our challenge to step up to the plate and do some of the things that were suggested by our parents and by our students and by our teachers and by this leadership. We've got to change the mentality. We've got to change the wording. We've got to change our beliefs about what is possible in Baltimore City with regard to education. And I think you've gotten a lot of information today. We were supposed to do some networking. We're going to do networking over sandwiches, you guys. <laughs> It's just going to be a different way of doing it. All of these folks will be available for you to talk with. But guess what? Some of these people are my personal friends, but I picked up the phone and said, hey, Dr. Santalises, I heard some great stuff about you. Will you come out and do this panel? It doesn't take April Von Garrett or Civic Frame or Amplify Baltimore for you to have these conversations with the people in your communities. I really encourage you to do them at the kitchen table, to do them at the pub, to do them wherever you gather, to have these engaging conversations, to engage your politicians in such a way where it's not combative, but to say, look, these are some of my issues. Can you enlighten me? Can you give me resources so that I can make this better? These conversations are about providing you with information and tools so that you all can be agents of change in Baltimore and the communities that you love. And so I'm hoping that we did something by, by that today. I'm hoping that you are enlightened, encouraged, and empowered, as my dear friend Tavis Smiley always says. And I hope that you will always amplify Baltimore. Enjoy lunch.
Did you get your mug? I did get my mug. Is your mug in there? Oh, no. You know why? Because oh, wait, I have water. Because have water in it. That one has water in it. Well, that's okay. We'll, we'll work it out. Yeah, consolidate. You. There you <laughs> go. It's like, I'm like, consolidate. This is Tom. Oh, hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Tell me your last name. Maze with Z. Oh, very good. Nice to meet like you. Like, no, like, like amazing. Oh, oh, that's very good. That's what you want. I wanted to meet you. He does incredible things. He's a great consultant. Let me just say, I am so critical of the school system on my talk show. And I am so critical of the school system because I think it's a great system. But I think we have great people making it better. We never should lose sight of how we can improve. Because that's when we... That's when we, those kids fall through. When we go, you know what? We're awesome. I finally, we you know, the awesome. people, and that's the problem if we take the Maryland just never won the ball. Oh, yeah. Right? Because then people are like, woo, let's slide, and da 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 da. Right? Right now. Oh, oh he's, he needs, to, to, let you, he needs to, to let you talk more. Who he? Dr. Ron. He does, though. He's oh, good. Yeah. He's been talking about a bingo the size of Baltimore. Get on the program. She's awesome. And you're passionate. And I feel like he lectures us. You're passionate, and I can listen to you lectures all oh, day. Oh, thank you for that. But, but you know, but we have to translate it, too. Oh, That's what I tell you. <laughs> but I'm glad to meet you. I want, I want to set up a time when I can talk with you. Absolutely. Do you, as a matter of fact, I just wrote it down for the homeschooling parent, but I can give you, I can, huh? You do? Oh, oh, we'll see. If you buy lunch or breakfast, that's where, where, it. Where do you live? Um, we live in Chief. Roland Park. Hey, it's good to see yes, you. Yes, Good too. work. So, so great. Yes, everything is good. I was a little surprised by a little bit of news. Yeah. That our CEO. Credit shared. Yeah, I was like, what? Yeah, I, I had a, a lot of thought went into that, and I'm a fan of the current person. Um, and so, you know, like I, I told you, it's going really well this year with my daughter. So, from a parent perspective, and um, things are on. Well, you know, hold on. Yeah, okay. But, but I, like I said, I was just, I was like, I, when when he showed me, I was like, excuse me? <laughs> I was like. I've been pretty open about sharing my thoughts in the opposite direction for well, I, some time. Well, that's so why I was so. I was, uh, uh, it's great to meet you. Do you have a phone number? Um, sure. Uh, uh, between this number and you. This is my cell. Because I can't remember my office. <laughs> okay, so, although the email's better, because if you want, then I can just forward it to my assistant, who's a great. Yeah. 